Opa, pessoal, boa tarde. Então, a gente vai estar dando início ao colóquio uh, do Instituto de Física, aqui da Universidade de São Paulo. E para apresentar nosso uh, speaker, I'm going to invite the professor Marco Leite to uh, give the proper introduction to Professor Steven. So, good afternoon. It's our great pleasure to receive here at the University of São Paulo, Steve. So Steve is a physicist from the University of Melbourne, working at the Atlas experiment at CERN. He is the, the, the webmaster of the Atlas public web page, so he is uh, responsible to convey the work of uh, almost 5,000 physicists in the experiment to the, the general public. He is also the contact for diversity and inclusion of the Atlas experiment, and has been twice appointed as the Atlas uh, outreach coordinator. Steve is also former chair of the International Particle Physics Outreach Group, group on-site coordinator of EEU summer student and research semester abroad programs for American undergraduates at CERN, and advisory board member for the Quark Net. Quark Net is the outreach network on the US uh, United States. Uh, in his spare time, uh, Steve uh, fronts the Canets Blue Blend, the, the, the group behind the, the Atlas Buggy Music he may tell you a little bit more about in his presentation. So thank you, Steve. Welcome to Sao Paulo. Okay, thank you very much. I think I'll just speak with this, so I'll let you have that. Okay, so welcome everybody. Thank you very much for the kind invitation to come here. Uh, I've always dreamt of coming to Sao Paulo one day when I was a, a young child, which is centuries ago. Uh, uh, we had an exchange student from Sao Paulo. So I had known the name when I was very young, Sao Paulo. I had no idea where it was. Now I know. Um, so it's, it's nice to be here. Um, I want to thank the students for coming here for this. I, uh, you're not breaking a straight line here. This is, this is a good idea to come because I think communication, especially during strikes, is, is, is extremely important. Communication is a very important part of our lives. And so I'm going to talk to you a little bit about that. Um, I put up here uh that this was the um the importance and urgency of science education and outreach i was invited once to go to something which was way over my head it was a strategic management society and uh the person who invited me uh marcus nordberg he was our uh resource coordinator for the atlas experiment at cern uh so that's takes a lot of strategic thought to build a device like that um, and he's a member of the society and he invited me to come along and I was pretty much lost, but I always remember this two by two matrix. Uh, and there was an importance and there was urgency on that. And I was told very clearly, forget three of those squares and just remember that fourth square. Uh, so I'm saying here that this is, this is both important and urgency and, and urgent. Um, these, uh, these are people uh, who probably many of us going into science tried to avoid. Uh, it's the public. Uh, uh, they're, they're very nice people though, and I urge you to get to know them sometime when you can. Um, they're important to us and uh, they do a lot of hard work. Uh, they get us, they feed us, they help to build our, our homes, our infrastructure, uh, they uh, they protect us. They do a lot of very important things, and they work very hard all day long, as as we do. But hard work, um, and they might, I would expect, from time to time, ask this simple question: Why? Uh, why should they, who work so hard all day long, give a little part of their salary for us to play around with particles, to do something as esoteric as as fundamental research. Why? They deserve an answer to that because they're supporting us, right? Um, this is another slightly lower form of human being. Um, these are our world leaders. They're important nonetheless. They, they have to make big decisions that affect all of us. And um, we respect the difficulty of those decisions. Uh, they all, it's amazing how similar these, these look for democracies, at least all around uh, the world. They have, we hope, an important question that they're asking themselves, and that's how much. Um, and that's, you know, how much of, of all these, they have to 
take care of, of a huge number of constituents, need to make sure that everybody has what they need, uh, that they're healthy and they're surviving. Um, but how much of that should they dedicate to fundamental research, science research? Important question. Then there's a much higher life form. Uh, these are students, uh, probably the highest life form. I hate to say this, but it all goes downhill from here. Um, these people have also some very important questions that they ask themselves now. Uh, a couple, who should they believe? There's a lot of stuff out there, a lot of information out there. And what to do? What should they do with their lives? How should they dedicate themselves for the future? What are the answers that they all see? Well, 10 years ago, we had some really nice answers. Actually, now it's 11. Um, there was this nice seminar that happened on the 4th of July in 2012. It was a wonderful, wonderful time. Any of us who were involved in particle physics at the time, or anyone in science at the time, was excited about this. This was really a technical seminar. I can tell you that um, we had beautiful, usual technical uh, uh, slides here. You can see the comic sand on the nice color scheme that Fabiola used, uh, who was our, at the time, she was the spokesperson. She's now the director general of CERN, but she was the spokesperson for the Atlas experiment. We were presenting just after Joan Candela of the CMS experiment, who had the most important number being 113 slides that he went through for this. It was a very, very long technical seminar, like any of the ones that we have, uh, and they're fantastic to go and sit through, but it is technical and it's designed so that anybody in here can stand up and say, no, I think you've got a mistake and, and ask questions about, you know, it's science. So it's peer, properly peer reviewed. In this case, we were pretty happy uh, to see the results that, that came out. Um, we had invited the public to come to this. Not, not much public usually comes to our seminars, but we, we streamed this. Um, and this was the result in the days that, that, that happened afterwards. Uh, it was all over the media. A discovery had been made. People were very, very excited. Um, you might think, you know, this is, wow, look at this. So we're in the Hindu, we're in the Al Jazeera, we're, we're um, BBC, uh, all, all these different, you know, The Economist. But I think the most telling thing to see up here is we made the front page of Auto World uh, magazine. We never make the front page of Auto World magazine. Science is not usually on the front page of Auto World magazine. It was really, really considered by the, the public important, so much so that there were over a billion people who saw video from that. That's pretty good. That's, that's good outreach. So first step, you know, make a big discovery. That's, uh, that, helps, that helps a lot. Um, but yeah, over a billion people saw a video from that. They, they, they thought there was something fundamental that happened here. They were right. There was something fundamental that happened. Um, it's an inspiring story that we could tell. And we did. We told it a lot. And we still tell this story. Because um, it dates back, way, way back. This was also a seminar that happened on the 4th of July. It was many, many years earlier. But it was really the beginning of our field. Uh, this is Og. She was a brilliant uh, spokesperson for a collaboration, which was pretty large at the time. And she was discussing uh, the results of Zog's. This is her student, of course, who did the work. Um, and he discovered something that was fundamental to our field, believe it or not. He smashed rocks together and discovered that they were made up of smaller rocks. He also discovered, though, the rule that has stuck with us ever since and which popped up even in quantum mechanics, is that the more energy you stick into it, the deeper you can probe into matter. And that drives everything we do today. Um, it was really groundbreaking research, I would say, at the time. Um, this was the, the primary device that Zog was using, other than his hands to smash things together brilliant, beautiful device that can reach tens of microns in precision and also see way out to Andromeda, two and a half million light years away. It's a wonderful device, uh, but we needed upgrades to go further. So we built upgrades. Uh, we started with optical microscopes. Uh, we then went up to, we found out, well, Zog said higher energy, so let's go to electrons. We went to electrons, we got to higher energy. We could see hairs even on this guy here. Um, it, it, with amazing, amazing resolution. Uh, and then we started to look at other means to look into matter. Uh, and this is, this is a wonderful thing. It's still around at CERN. If you get to CERN, you can see this in our sort of graveyard of old uh, particle detectors. 
Um, it's all right now covered in brush because we haven't we've neglected this while we were building the new science gateway, which is fantastic. It's going to open in another week. Um, but this is still here. This is the Gargamel bubble chamber, and it discovered neutral uh, flavor changing neutral currents was turned out to be really critical to our field. It helped us to discover uh, weak interaction. Um, but we started to learn that you could look at, say, cosmic rays, or you could look, you could bombard targets with a with a, a, a beam and see what was going on inside. This was fundamental. From that, we started thinking, ah, you know, if we can make collisions uh, of beams, we could get to even higher energies. And so we started to do that. Uh, this this came, uh, this, this would be, I think this is actually PS, but the SPS came about and, uh, and we were able to start finding out things and, and those flavor changing neutral currents that we saw in the bubble chamber, we could actually measure them precisely. And we did that as time went on and so we learned bit by bit the nice nice story to tell the world we went to higher energies we started to probe deep inside and we started to learn things uh what did we learn from all that stuff uh you know we learned you know what we're made out of you know there's the hair that you saw there well it's it's actually made up of cells and then we probed inside and we found the molecules that made up the cells and then we got inside the molecules and we found atoms inside there and bit by bit we got to the nucleus we saw the nucleus was made up of protons and neutrons I'm giving you that this is all the particle physics right here all, all done you don't need to take these long courses i don't think this everything's here um but then we went further and 50 years ago or so we started to realize that we had quarks inside these protons so we got to a point where we thought and this has happened in the past we gotten down to what was elementary, the elementary particles. And we were able to write this all up in a nice, simple table of elements, which is something we like to do. Uh, and you can see that we had uh, this set of, of material uh, particles here, uh, the fermions, and we had the bosons. This statistics tells you the difference between the two, but these are the, the carriers of the forces. And these are essentially what things are made up of. But in fact, you only really need the guys on the far left here, the up quarks, down quarks, electrons, you can make a cake. If you have up quarks, down quarks, and electrons, you can make a cake. You can make anything. You make a planet. It's all you really need because these are stable. Why are they stable? Well, these guys are exactly the same, charm, top, exactly the same as the up quark, but much more massive very strange if you don't know why they're i told you they're elementary particles we have mass because we had lunch right so there's energy inside us most of our mass is binding energy it's not these guys these guys take up very little mass inside us um even inside a proton a proton the, the up and down quarks are a very small amount of the mass it's the the strong nuclear force that that energy that's binding it together um so these guys here are what's important. These guys are more massive. And this just struck us as this is all very strange. Why would an elementary particle have mass? The actual real questions came when we started to, to, to understand this weak nuclear force because these guys have really big mass. We were used to photons, which have no mass, right? They can go very, very far and they go at the speed of light. And that's what we sort of at the time thought that all of those particles that carried forces had no mass. Uh, but then we ran into this problem. The weak nuclear force was weak for a reason. They were massive. And we had to try to figure that out. But in the meantime, we also had that question about all these other particles, these, these, you know, these muons hitting us through the head all the time had a mass much more than an electron. Why? They're exactly the same thing, but more massive. So we had this sort of big question. These, this guy, well, not just this guy, Peter Higgs, also Francois Angler, Robert Brut, came up with an idea to try to explain this mass, why elementary particles have mass. They explained that symmetry was broken in the very, very early universe. The symmetry before, before this, even before I was a student, there was, everything was massless. But at a very, very short time after the Big Bang, uh, a field appeared absolutely everywhere. Condensed this field. You know, fields can condense. Actually, not everybody knows this, but you know, if you have a magnet and you heat it up, the field goes away, the magnetic field will go away. And as it cools down, the field will come back. 
uh, the same thing happened at much higher temperatures after the Big Bang. This field appeared as a uniform field, unlike any other field. And the, the mass of an elementary particle just simply tells you how much it interacts with that field. It doesn't really tell you. We often say, as a circular argument, we say that's, well, particles have mass because of this field. I like to think of it as an inherent property of a particle, much like charge. If you have something with different charges in an electromagnetic field, it will interact more with an electromagnetic field. Uh, so different particles had different masses based on how much they interact with this field. This was the solution proposed um, by, uh, by Peter Higgs, Francois Angler, and Robert Brut in 1964. Um, we used that equation. We put it on coffee cups, <laughs> uh, put it on T-shirts. Um, and we, we sold these long before any discovery was made. We were cheating here. The bottom two rows of his coffee cups have that field in it. We had not even discovered it. We had no evidence real for it, really for it, except, well, things had mass. Uh, but we used these coffee cups to make predictions, and those predictions came true. Um, amazingly, I mean, we, the, the top quark to me blows my mind because we, we, we knew what the, we didn't know just what, what its properties were, what its charge was. We knew what its mass was from all the constraints of this cup before we had found the Higgs field. So we really believed in this thing uh, when we set out to try to show that it was true. We did that by building this. So this is, uh, this is my home. Well, I'm actually over here uh, somewhere. Uh, but this is outside of Geneva, Switzerland. Um, the border goes somewhere all around through here. In fact, all of uh, these guys happen to be in France. Atlas is in Switzerland, but there's no lines. In fact, you don't see this from the air. You'll see some buildings. Uh, if you land at the airport, you can see the building which houses uh, LHCB. Um, this uh, large tunnel is 100 meters underground. Roughly, ground is not perfect, but roughly 100 meters. In fact, the ground gives us a bit of a challenge because it's at a slight angle. The Jura Mountains are here and the lake is here. So it's got a few degrees there. So this, this whole ring here was built at a slight angle. And at four different places, we collide protons together. And that's where we put our detectors. We want to see what's going on in those collisions. So Zog is at work at each of these places. And we like to see what comes out from that. These are the beautiful, beautiful devices at those places. You've probably seen these before. Many of you have. Um, they're, every single one of these experiments is outstanding. Uh, they have, they're, you know, the, the size is, is hard to explain. This, this, this guy is one I work on, Atlas. It's the largest in volume. CMS is twice the mass just because of the construction, the magnets that are used, the material that's used. Um, these two are really kind of like the uh, most powerful lenses on the microscope. You can really think of the LHC as a microscope. They're the most powerful lenses. And, uh, and these are more specialized. Uh, Alice is designed really specifically to look at heavy ion collisions and LHCB uh, is looking, try to understand the, the asymmetry of matter and energy. I'm not going to go into detail much of the physics because I want to get to education knowledge, right? But it's, it's good to know this. So finally, uh, in 2012, after only a couple of years, that was really surprising for us. It was, we thought it would take longer than that. Um, we were able to see several signals here. This here you can see, a, uh, you can see a, these are Higgs candidates, right? We never know. Um, Heisenberg will never let us know exactly what these are. But these are Higgs candidates. This is before electrons. This is two photons in CMS. Um, and we made the discovery, of course, statistically. Um, today, you have just enormous signals that you could never neglect. This, this, this all right here is the four lepton signal. And it's even grown since then. Uh, and um, most importantly, it's really, really well verified now that the Higgs field is the Higgs field. Okay, this is how much the particles uh, interact with the Higgs, and this is their mass. And there's this beautiful line. It's a logarithm. That's what made it such a challenge. But I mean, look at look at them fall perfectly on that line. So if they have a higher mass, it's because they're interacting more with the Higgs field. That's been made very, very clear. We will have enough data at the end of this run probably to nail down the muon. 
the lighter ones are, are, are much harder to get. And we hope at some point just the Higgs also interacting with itself. That's something we're looking for because the Higgs has a mass, it interacts with itself. Okay, so there's some physics. But, so this is all this great story that we could tell. And we told this story after the discovery, people were happy and, and the truth was the truth. And that was great. <clears throat> but things have changed since back then when we were building the Large Hadron Collider. And now when someone looks out there to see what's going on in the world of science, um, they'll see this. Um, it's kind of a shame, <laughs> but this is what's out there. Okay, I know we try to hide in our bubble, but that's what's out there. Horrible, horrible things. Um, and they're being said by people who are very influential, even world leaders, believe it or not. Um, <laughs> I, I also, you know, I have a lot of empathy for Brazil because I also lived uh, in a country with a world leader who was, um, well, not leading us in the right direction at the time. And uh, they really, really hurt science just by saying things. Uh, and that's really hard to recover from. It's always much easier to be negative than to be positive. It's much easier. Uh, to try to rebuild trust is really, really hard thing when you have someone who's just, just saying words against it, you know, saying that this science is fake. Look, there's a snowball, so therefore there was no global warming. Um, what fires? I don't see any fires in the Amazon. Um, this guy, unfortunately, had, an, had a very predictable, unfortunate end to his life as he tried to show that the world was flat. Um, and uh, well, I'm not gonna go into more details. You might recognize people or not on there. Uh, if this is another really sad thing to do, but if you go to YouTube and log out, so it doesn't know any who you are, your past search background or anything, and do a search for CERN, that's what you see. And, and that's a challenge. Um, she's great. Uh, science girl, she came to visit, and there's, I wish there were many, many more like her, because there's a lot of people like this putting a lot of garbage out there uh, about what CERN is and how we're going to destroy the planet. I mean, not, we thought we already proved that we didn't destroy the planet. We turned on the LHC and the planet's still here, uh, but people are still convinced uh, that we're doing some very evil things. There. So who created this mess that we're in? Um, well, <laughs> there's this guy. A uh, really nice guy, Tim Berners-Lee, uh, and he did a lot of work. And I think you can see his wonderful machine here in 1989, 1990, around when that was happening. I really remember uh, at the time I was at CERN, and they showed me this little application where you could hit uh, tab to go from uh, different um, hyperlinks to hyperlink and then hit return if you wanted to go down one of the hyperlinks. And it evolved since then. I think it's going to catch on. Um, so, but that's, that's not really fair, right? He made a tool that was really useful. Uh, it allowed us to communicate what its design was for scientific um, papers and all of that. And now we have everything we need. I can travel around the world and find out how to get from the airport to here without any problem. It's all here. I even know where I'm at on that map. Um, so it's not really fair to blame him um, or, or all of CERN. But what have we learned? about the web so far. Um, well, it's a great tool, as I said, for disseminating scientific knowledge. So we have it all there. You can get anything you want. You can find it well. It's even better uh, for <laughs> videos of cats. Fantastic. Um, and uh, it's absolutely perfect for conspiracy theories and for making hatred. This is a challenge. I know you guys know about this challenge, but I just want to make sure we remember what we're up against. Um, these guys did a study. Um, they're from MIT, so they're all right, kind of smart. And um, they found that, uh, something that you'd expect, I guess, but they found that falsehood diffuses significantly farther, faster, deeper, and more broadly than the truth uh, in all categories of information. Uh, and in many cases, by an order of magnitude. That's kind of sad. Um, so uh, this, this was a discovery they did just by following information on, on the web. And they're, they're not the only study like this. Um, is that a surprise to any of us? Uh, you've tried to write a paper, right? <laughs> These can take a long time, um, a really long time to get the right information out. I mean, 
exaggeration might be the the w mass paper for atlas just because it's it was it was something which required understanding every single systematic possible systematic uncertainty of that measurement it was years and years using the same data that we'd taken early on uh to to get something out which which was really really high precision it's not easy you know you come up with an idea you you go and you 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 look for a signal maybe you see something the first thing we do is we doubt ourselves right we're scientists we look at it if we see a bump in a distribution we usually say okay what did i do wrong i made a cut somewhere that's making a bump and then we show our colleagues after we've convinced ourselves it's real and then they tell us no that's wrong and then then if they're convinced then you go on to a bigger circle and you have to go to the publishing and then finally if your entire collaboration agrees and we have 3000 authors in atlas and cms is the same then you can submit it and then it's going to hit people from other experiments who are going to read it it's a hard hard journey to get something out but when we publish it's the truth I've seen very, very few erratum published by any of the LHC experiments. Very few, and they're usually about a detail. There's, there's just hardly, there's no paper retractions that you can see anymore. They're very, very well checked. Um, on the other hand, um, there's other ways to get communication out instantly. And, uh, and so it's not really a surprise that lies get out there much more quickly. People want simple answers. They have problems, they want a simple answer. You give them a simple answer, they'll be happy with it and they'll go. But in our field, our problems are complex. Um, these, are, these are future plans. I don't know if you've seen all of these. Uh, these are mentioned in the European strategy that was put out several years back. Uh, we have some great ideas for new uh, colliders um, and, and new detectors to go around them. Uh, linear colliders here, click would be at CERN, ILC has looked at different places, Japan, the US have looked at that, uh, China is getting into the business and looking into building a, a, a collider, uh, I think it's great that they're coming coming along with that, um, there's the FCC, it's a terrible acronym, future circular collider, some people use F for another word, but it's big, really i mean probably they're down to 91 kilometers now but i don't know if you know the geneva area but you can go to honesty around that ring <laughs> it's, it's huge the idea but it, it's the zog principle you need higher energy to probe deeper and we're going to run you know we're not going to get all the answers from high luminosity lhc or the runs that come after that probably uh and so we will be interested in something like this this is a really i really am a fan of this I don't know if it's going to work. It's come, it's, 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 it's come up, it's gone down, it's come up, it's gone down. Capturing muons long enough to accelerate them to high enough energy to make collisions. Muons, as I mentioned, they're, they're, they're a couple hundred times more massive than electrons. So if you can make collisions, they're elementary particles. You can really probe and do really cool things with, with a muon collider. But holding onto them long enough to, to get the collisions is, is really quite a trick. Um, so there's a lot of really great ideas there that we need support, public support, if we want to build at least a few of these. And I think they're all going to get built. And the plans, this is long, long term. This isn't, I mean, for the students, I'm sorry to say this is this is not for you. This is for your grandchildren. Okay. <laughs> um, for the students, we have HLLHC. It's going to have a lot of really good. In fact, we have the data we're taking in this run, run three. Uh, and and there, there's a lot of long future of the LHC still in, in store. And there's a lot of other really great experiments. I'm very LHC centric here, but there's a lot of really cool stuff. I don't know if you saw the news, but just a couple of days ago, they published that antimatter falls down from alpha. Uh, they're going to do another study of this from GBAR. I think GBAR originally wanted to, to get the scoop, but um, uh, that's really cool stuff. There's a lot of really, really cool physics going on and all around the globe, uh, not just at, at, at CERN. Um, but the, these are long, long-term plans, and we need to get the public on board for these. We have to get them past all the garbage and seeing the value of elementary research. Um, just one last thing building up here. The, 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 you know, I don't know if you guys, you took Economics 101. This is all I remember from Economics 101. I saw this other thing here. It was, it was, this was discussing, it was a paper discussing illegal drug trade. But the main point that they made here is you need to not just decrease supply you need to decrease demand in order to decrease supply decreasing supply also decreases demand okay that they're closely related they were talking about illegal drugs but we have a more important thing is is 
lies and conspiracy theories. Same question. How do we decrease our demand for these conspiracy theories and, and also decrease their supply? And we can't just do this. It's not going to work. These guys, you get rid of one. I think they got rid of him, actually. He's off of Fox, but a new two or three will pop up. What we need is for the public to realize this is garbage and to turn it off. Uh, and that's hard work, but they have to be educated. So this is the way I propose we go about it. Um, education, outreach, and communication uh, are the best ways to really reach in and try to decrease the public's demand and students' demand and everyone in between uh, for these conspiracy theories and lies. Um, I like to define pretty well the, the acronyms. <laughs> um, communication uh, to me is stuff that's done really primarily by professionals. We do it ourselves, but I think of it, these, this acronym here, EPPCN is from Europe because I'm working at CERN. Uh, also interactions though is international. These are people who know how to develop a, a, a communication strategy. They have professionals to write things up to target specific audiences and um, to make material which is gonna be effective for those different audiences. Uh, I know as particle physicists, as any scientist, we always believe we can do anything, uh, but these guys are have studied communication and, uh, and we really rely on them and we work with them to try to create material which can go out to the world uh, explaining what we do. Um, IPOG, which I chaired for the past six years, International Particle Physics Outreach Group, we're a little bit lower level. We're, we're really fundamental there. We're trying to establish an understanding of the scientific process. Okay, so how is it we go about finding if something is real or not? Um, getting an appreciation for doing fundamental research, building trust. Of course, both deal with the building trust, but that's really what we have to do. Build trust by demonstrating, by showing how we go from this step to this step, all the steps in between being transparent, that builds trust. And then of course, training our next generation of scientists. And that can start at a very young age and it should start at a young age. Uh, my claim, um, we have to do this education, outreach and communication today in order for us to do the things we wanna to do tomorrow. And I think that's really key. Um, a lot of people think, okay, you get here's, here's your funding, go and do your research, and there's a little bit left over, then you can go ahead and do some education and, and outreach with that. We'll, we'll give you the right to do that. Uh, it doesn't work that way. You have to do the education and outreach first. You have to have the public on board before you can get the funding to be able to do your research. That's really, really important. And so I flip things around there and I think it gets it should have a, a higher priority. Um, so just an introduction to IPOG. This is going to be IPOG centric because I chaired it for six years and, and I think there's a lot that we do in there. There's a lot of other ways to do education and outreach. But we have a lot that we're just sort of a, a network. So we're a network that, that's comprised of, of researchers, people who are doing uh, active research now, but also people who are uh, teachers or people who are communicators working together so that we can sort of learn how to build material that is useful. Um, we're a global network. When I say, so there's 40 members at the moment, we've been increasing. Uh, we have 33 countries, six of the major, six major experiments. So there's the international collaborations. There's four experiments on the, on the LHC. Um, uh, we also uh, have Hawk in Mexico. They're an international collaboration uh, there as well. We have, um, uh, a couple associate, so we, we own oh, international labs. And so international labs can be a member. If they're a national lab, uh, like DAISY and GSI or both in Germany, uh, we don't want to give too many votes for one country. So, so they're associate members, but they participate actively. Um, we organize global activities. And I'm gonna talk to you a bit about these in a little bit more detail. And then we also support local activities. So if we're doing something, if you have some, some festival you want to go to and to do some education and outreach, uh, we can provide some expertise, some material, maybe some translation, because we have people uh, from many, many different countries. Um, and we help to kickstart activities. We expect things to continue uh, by, the, by the people who are doing the work. It should be done locally. Um, 
this is this is our current membership. Uh, our last member to join was was Mexico. I was there last fall. Um, I think it's great. Brazil has been a member for some time. I think uh, I think it was 2018 when they signed. Um, mo many of these, actually, most of these were members before, but it was a very it was informal. If someone wanted to join, they just joined, and we all got together and we met. At a certain point, we tried to make it formal. And people signed an MOU because that gives them more support. And I'll, I'll explain that in a little bit. But here you can see, um, oh, I forgot to mention Bell too. That's the other experiment I didn't, didn't mention there. So this is who we have now. Uh, the Baltic states, they're in green because we've already tacitly approved them, but they have to figure out which funding agency is gonna sign. You have to have somebody with some money to sign the document. It's not a large amount of money that we're talking about here. The most, the most amount of money is paid by the ones with the highest GDP, like the US, and that's 5,000 per year. That's not a lot of money for this, for what they get out of this. Um, but that helps us because it allows us to get some support. And this is the kind of support we have. So most of us volunteer for this. The chairs volunteer their time. Uh, Pedro Abreu uh, from, from Portugal. Uh, and uh, I tried to get him to come here, but he wasn't able to. He was at another event because he actually speaks Portuguese. Uh, <laughs> I got to Boa Dia, Boa Tarde, and Obrigado, and, and that was it. Um, uh, so he's he's been he served with me. I served alongside him uh, for uh, for three years, uh, and then I was just replaced uh, in January by Claire. Uh, Claire has also been doing outreach for quite some time. So so. IPOG's in very good hands. These are both people with a lot of experience doing that. But their job is basically to steer things, just make sure that all the people doing the work have what they need. And that's that's a challenge. Um, we have a core team now, and this is why we made an MOU, is to have enough money to get... Um, we have our own Fabiola, uh, Fabiola Cacciatore. She's fantastic. She's made our social media grow immensely uh, because she's younger than me. That was easy. Um, but uh, she's just very, very good uh, with that. Uh, we get some help also from Lila, uh, who's actually part of a, she's a CERN fellow who dedicates part of her time, uh, thanks to CERN. CERN provides that resource. And um, we have also CERN providing us with administrative support, which is very, very valuable. Uh, we have coordinators for the ma international master classes and for global cosmics, which I'll tell you what those are, uh, who have been around for some time and have, they're all fantastic people. Uh, without Uta and Ken, none of this stuff would, would exist. Uh, and I'm sure Ken has been down here at some point. He goes all over the place doing master classes. We have some organizational bodies, blah, 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 but you know, it, 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 it's stuff that you need to make something work, right? We have steering groups. Our most recent so working group, I was very happy when we added one on inclusion and accessibility, um, just to try to see that we're hitting not just many countries, but within a country, a bigger variety of people and making sure that we're just accessible to everyone. And, and we're, we're just in the early stages here. But this has popped up all over. I don't know if you've seen this, but it's happened in the experiments. Uh, it's happened at the laboratories. Uh, it's a it's a key phrase because there, there's probably some resources for that, <laughs> but also because it's we've we've learned that that's a very very important thing. We know this uh, by international uh, diversity, right? We've always known this. Those those of us in science working in international collaborations realize very quickly the value of having people from all over with different opinions, different social backgrounds, cultural backgrounds, even linguistic backgrounds, their ideas are important uh, to bring to the picture. But you shouldn't leave off, for example, our field in particle physics forgot about women uh, for a long time. We're at maybe 23% now uh, at CERN. It's pathetic. And we're working on, on improving that. So that's part of our, our need for diversity. Um, so one of the most important things that we do is we get together to meet. Um, these are really hands-on fun meetings. Uh, we share, we show off our stuff, the things that we've built, uh, the new cosmic ray detector that we built that's cheaper and that works better. Uh, we discuss different ideas, best practices. Um, this is this is our wonderful group here. Uh, many of the many of the leaders from the different countries are there, uh, as well as whoever's around who who wants to share what they're doing. We invite people to come in who we know have given, like this guy here, a very uh, animated person, is a teacher who rides his bike across Europe, down Africa, across Canada, crazy Canadian guy, but he came to show off how, as a teacher, all the different things that he's developed. And so we learn from them and get their input. 
Um, our last meeting we held in the spring was in Sofia, Bulgaria. So, so typically every other meeting is hosted by uh, a, a member state, not yet Brazil, in case anyone's interested. Um, I would be interested if Brazil wanted to host us. Um, and you know we have a variety of different meetings of all these groups. We also did a public event. I love doing this. This is my favorite thing. I did. I did a music of physics public event. Something that, that just can draw in the public. You let the public know, hey, we're here. Sorry that we're using up all your bus seats uh, while we're in your in your city because this happens. You have like 500 people going to one of these major conferences. It's nice to to add some public events so they know why you're here and have a chance to ask questions. So whatever you can do. Music of physics was a nice way to answer questions, but um, there's can be simple, can be so it can be a screening of a of a simple film like Particle Fever, and then answering questions. Uh, so we have public events as well. And this is just our wonderful looking people all doing sharing their best practices and a little bit of fondue as well. Um, oops, something else. Um, this is just to show that of course we're on everything. Um, because mainly because of Fabiola Cacciatore, uh, but we are, uh, if you just look for IPOG or IPOG org, uh, you'll find us on pretty much everything uh, that's out there, even doing TikTok. And um, this, this really helps us to reach a variety of people, right? This is, this is a good way to get a diverse audiences, especially I mean, if you want to get, if you just sit around on Facebook, you get a nice lot of old white middle-aged men right? Uh, but if you can move to other platforms, uh, such as Instagram or TikTok, you can get a wider range of people that are involved. Um, so particle physics masterclasses, they happen here in Brazil. You might be aware of it. Maybe you've contributed to that and helped out. If not, you should. Uh, they're fantastic. Uh, the basic idea is this, is that uh, students, usually in high schools, uh, are invited to a university or they're invited to a laboratory. They come in there, uh, they're given a tour and they're made into researchers for a day. So they learn about the research that happens at that place. And then they're given real data and they're given real tools and they do things like look for mass peaks or things like this in the data. So it's it made a big difference when we moved to real data uh, that gets them excited. And I think that's important. This is something that's missing in education. Somehow we go through education and we learn F equals MA and we take a ball and we roll it down a ramp. But here, these students, even if it's just for a day, come and they get to meet researchers who are really doing it and they find out that we're actually human beings. And, um, and, and, and then they can ask us their questions. Again, being able to answer their questions. So this is, this is really good and it's really great for us because you have to answer tough questions uh, when you do this. So they do the analysis, and at the end, they get to be part of an international collaboration because they have a worldwide video conference where they connect with each other and they share their results with each other. Um, and our numbers now uh, from the spring are almost back to the pre-pandemic numbers. It took quite some time, but now I think we're gonna expand much further because we also have connections now that are Zoom only in addition to having it in person. And that did work in a lot of cases. So, And we've also expanded the different types of master classes we do. So I think we're in the stage of expansion, reaching out. We wanna get this numbers somewhere up around 8 billion would make me very happy. If we could have a total of 8 billion people taking them, then that'd be good. Um, we usually start out on the International Day for Women and Girls in Science. Uh, it's usually, I think the 11th of February, this, this past year was on the, we did it on the 10th because that was a Sunday or for some reason it was worked out better. Um, and this is really nice because we, we, we get role models for them and we have a lot of really good mo role models, very, very bright uh, scientists uh, who can talk to the, to the students. And uh, we have moderators uh, who, who help out as well. Uh, here's, here's Clara, Particle Clara, if you want to see TikTok. <laughs> She's doing a whole lot of them. She's, I, I really like what she does there. Um, this, uh, I should mention this because this was really rough for us. A few years back, I got invited by the International Association of Physics uh, students uh, to talk with them. I told them about master classes. They got very excited. Uh, so I remember talking to someone from Armenia, and then there was someone who was from Ukraine, and they said, hey, you know, uh, let's do this in Ukraine. Uh, let's do it. And we did it in Kiev, I think, the first time, and, and, and it worked pretty well. It was all Zoom because of COVID, 
but they plan the next year to do it in person, to do it in Kharkiv, and to do it in that classroom, unfortunately. Uh, fortunately, this happened before uh, the master class happened. Um, so uh, we had to stop that completely. This put us in a difficult situation um, because we already had plans all over the planet, including St. Petersburg and Moscow, as we always do. And we had to, we had to make a decision. The decision that we made was that um, we're not going to do them there. There's, you know, it was, it was, that was not easy because we've always left politics out. CERN always did that as well. But this was just so blatant that there was nothing that we could do. We, we could not avoid doing that. And the main problem I had was how was I going to explain to the students from Kharkiv that the following week, we did them anyway in St. Petersburg and Moscow. So we postponed everything in Russia and Ukraine until it's safe in both places for us to do the master classes. The good news behind this, I had a couple, I had three students actually, uh, Sasha couldn't make it for this picture, um, but um, we, uh, we got in touch with Kharkiv. This guy, Philippe's a, a true hero. He found a safe place for the students. He said, we're going to do the master classes. There's no way that this war is going to stop us from doing the master classes. He got them in a safe place. Uh, unfortunately, they, they got shelled the week before again and lost power. They were all okay. Uh, so we delayed it by a week, but we eventually had it. And um, I brought my students who had come over from Ukraine uh, to work with us. And we did a quick video conference with them just to show them that there's a future. And uh, these are brilliant students. They, were, they stayed outside of Ukraine. Uh, they're in school in the UK and in the US. Uh, but it really, I think it made a big impression on them so much that Philippe called me and he says, you've got to get some more resources. I've got more students for you. And we're going to have three more students in January. So things turned positively from this. I mean, I had some questions too about this because I was thinking, well, should I be pulling students out? Because, you know, the guys are being recruited to help fight this war, which is a very important thing. But you need to have people who are ready to rebuild that country as well. And so I think that these these people are going to be the, the leaders rebuilding the country. Um, another initiative called Global Cosmics. This is another global initiative um, that reaches uh, all around. We have an international muon week. Uh, this uh, happens in February where we do the, uh, different classrooms all around the globe measure cosmic ray rates. Um, so I think this this can be of interest here. Um, so and uh, it's run by Quarknet in in the U.S. They it covers all around here. You can see different cosmic ray detectors that were involved. Uh, this was also in Italy uh, because um, Sabine she comes from from INFN. Uh, and they ran a lot of students through a lot of different schools with cosmic ray detectors. It can be simple detectors that just do counting or something more complex uh, to look at showers, for example. Um, Global Cosmics also has an international cosmic day in November and uh, where other um, uh, students and teachers get involved in this from, from around the globe. Uh, another, another activity it's worldwide. It's very simple for high school students. They get data from uh, Atlas and CMS. Uh, simple distributions here. You would just have, for example, phi and theta, and they look at that, and then they can under, they can talk about it. Why is it look? Why is there a bump? Why does this have this shape to it? For example, in theta, uh, phi you expect to be pretty flat, but they can talk about efficiency and and, and things like that. Uh, so this is this this does a measurements over 24 hours and they do video conferences that go around uh, the globe. So these are just some of the things that are done. Corknet is a very strong partner of IPOG, the member. In fact, um, finally, and this this is a great program that's done at CERN Beamline for Schools. It targets high school students. Uh, they submit uh, ideas uh, for a, they get they're going to have access to a beam. The, and targets and <clears throat> detectors, and they submit a proposal, a tweet of intent, and uh, we get stacks of these. And people from IPOG often are contributing to try to look and to help them, to help to translate and to talk to them about how to make it, to make their ideas a little bit more solid. Uh, we had three winners this year. The Daisy has a team, um, and I think the teams came from uh, Pakistan, the US, 
and Greece, I believe this year. So we, we just help out with this. This is mainly a CERN initiative, but we help out with that. Other things that are going on that actually IPOG really doesn't necessarily play a role in, but helps to support if we can. Um, virtual visits. We just did one yesterday uh, to, a, to a classroom in, in Rio. Uh, and that was that was very nice. These students just stood in line and asked questions for over an hour. Uh, and you just have to have someone over here. In this case, I was over there actually. Um, this crazy teacher who was in Ghana at the time who who took the picture. Um, but he, I was uh, had the opportunity to be underground and just talk to them, you know. And it's fantastic the questions that they ask. Um, so, and then other things you can do, you can, you can do outreach anywhere. I think it's, and I think it's important that we do it, not just anywhere, but everywhere. Uh, this was a festival in the Czech Republic, a music festival at this old, uh, incredible, beautiful looking place. I mean, the, these blast furnaces uh, are, are still there and they, some of them have been converted and have restaurants around them. Uh, you can't do much on the inside of a blast furnace. Um, and I'm, this this is turned into a theater here. So this is this is actually expands. Uh, you know, when you put liquid in it, uh, I couldn't tell you all the details of all this. But this is basically a steel making place, really on the east part of the Czech Republic. But it is an incredible music festival. It has like seven stages going on all the time. Famous names come there in the summer, and these guys built in this building back here uh, uh, the Big Bang stage where they did all sorts of different. Um, exhibits, exhibitions, or talks. Um, you can see them all getting everybody together in a workshop um, uh, just, just to build these chambers here, show them how a cloud chamber works, how you can see particles. And I literally love uh, this guy. He, he's, he might be, he's, he's one of the two candidates to be our next outreach coordinator. Um, Martin does, has this nice talk on the physics of beer, which is very popular. I mean, it completely filled up the auditorium and there were people outside. Um, uh, so, so you can, you know, you can find physics in anything and you should do it. And I just uh, conclude with the, these different ideas is that even this, even this works. And I loved it when this came out. I think this is one of the coolest things. The, the, the book is just pictures, but there's that, there is a, 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 a code on it that you can scan. And then it has an explanation for whoever's the babysitter. Uh, so, so it, it, it's, it's, it's really, really nice. Or you can just chew on it if you want to, it's, it's, it's up to, up to you. Um, so I just, uh, I want, I do want to show you this little serious thing here. Um, we did get mentioned for every, I don't remember, seven years or 10 years, I forget. It happens in Europe. It happens in, uh, in North America. And I think it happened, I'm sure it happens now in, in South America as well. You have, you, you look at your strategy. Where do we want to go with our field? And we take this very, very seriously. The theorists think about work. What can we do next? What are, the, what are the next big ticket items out there in the decades to come? And people who build accelerators get involved in this. And we all write and contribute to this. And we included some chapters on education and outreach because they'd be necessary. And they were, um, they were mentioned in the final document. Uh, and I take this very seriously. Public engagement, education, and communication in particle physics should continue to be recognized as important components of the scientific activity and receive adequate support. So this is this is being read by policymakers in the countries. Uh, we got named here, made me very happy. Um, IPOG, we took on, um, we established the, our, our structural collaboration and our role could be further augmented by providing public engagement material, which we do because we have a database. One of those links that I showed you before leads to our resource database. Um, and then finally, and I think this is important for everyone, especially the students to know, and for the senior faculty as well, um, that uh, public engagement activities should be seen as an integral part of being a scientist and properly valued in terms of career advancement. So if you're senior faculty, take a look at that. You're looking at a CV. You've got a lot of CVs of people who are very talented. Yes, you want that they can build a detector, that they can do analysis, that they can write code. You also want them to be able to do communication, education, and outreach. That means they can communicate. That means they understand what they're doing. They get the big picture. They can explain it. They're gonna write much better proposals. They're valuable people. It is an integral part of, of us doing science is to be able to explain to the public what we're doing and why. Um, so I'll conclude by what I know about Brazil. Um, I don't know if you know this guy here. Uh, he invited me over here 
he he is our representative uh, of of Brazil in IPOG. Um, we signed this uh, 2018. I got to sign this. It was one of the fir first uh, documents I signed, and uh, and it was it was it, it, the head of Renefe at the time who signed it. So Renefe is the body, the signing body behind it. They guarantee <clears throat> what they sign on to here. What's really important here is not just that they're a member of IPOG. They're saying that they're going to support education and outreach in Brazil. So if you have plans, you have ideas, things that you want to do in education and outreach, you can remind them, you guys sign this. I need some support. Okay. Is there anybody here from Renefe? I don't want to get in trouble. <laughs> but you can remind them. I, and I think that's important. Actually, one country that joined fairly recently really took advantage of this is Georgia. And they went right back afterwards and they, we made an agreement. They said, we're going to supply this. You know, they dedicated to, to supplying a new um, visualization tool. And they went back to their minister and to the university. And they said, we want money because you guys signed this. And they got some resources. So, that, so, so I think it is important. And we also get to see him uh, from time to time. So he makes it to our meetings, which is really, really nice. He it gives us a lot of very important uh, feedback. And I, and I gave him this little feedback here, too, that we're, we're ready. To, to come here if he, if he wants to invite us. Um, and finally, I'll just conclude with this. Uh, so that you could scan that. I think I made that big enough so you can get it with your phone. Um, uh, this is the new portal. This is what we launched uh, two days ago. So this is IPOG Brazil. It's in Portuguese and it has access to all the different things, uh, including the database and lets you know what's going on in education outreach uh, in Brazil. Uh, I think that's it. So thank you. So the session is open for questions. Hi, uh, congrats on your presentation. Oh, I'm, you. My name is Rebecca. I'm a grad student. Um, you talk about the importance of, of talking to the public about what we do, uh, about scientific work. Mm -hmm. and, and we, as, as students, as professors, as researchers, as employees uh, of a public university, uh, we have a duty to do this as a public university. But what do you do when the university itself has a policy of hiding data of it? hiring data transparency has a policy of masking data. Okay, I don't know which data is being masked, um, but you change that, right? Your students, you change that, get that fixed. If there really is uh, something that's not transparent, and I know you guys are active, <laughs> I saw you. <laughs> um, so I think it's great, because I mean, you, you, have, uh, you have the faculty giving you your full support Right, they would like there to be more faculty as well. I don't know any details behind what you're saying, but of course, um, transparency is extraordinarily important. Everybody needs to be transparent, and, uh, and so uh, maybe you can tell me later on what's what, <laughs> what's being hidden. Uh, but that, but um, but yeah, it, it's 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 true. We need to be transparent in everything that we do. Okay, okay. Other questions? Um, I'm a senior professor here, and I've been working in outreach. I wonder, uh, do you have any feedback from the first master classes that you uh, organized? How many participants have decided to go into particle physics? This is the first question. The second question is, you have talked about uh, high school, but I think things, the whole is much deeper. We have to start with the fundamental education. Uh -huh. Does CERN have any proposal in doing some kind of uh, bridge in outreach with fundamental education? So an earlier education. Um, so I don't really speak for CERN. I, I work there. I've worked there for a long, long time, <laughs> but I can't speak for them. Um, but yeah, they, they are working on various things. Um, 
various projects uh, that are simple that can reach out to younger people. I think that in their in their science gateway that they just built, there's some activities that are really physical to help to teach you a little bit about quantum mechanics in a fun way. Um, whether or not they can reach out to the different education systems around the world, that's that's not so easy. Although it is possible, they invite. Um, teachers right now they, their focus has always been high school because they I think they felt that the level of mathematics or whatever needed to be a certain level to grasp the concepts I sort of disagree I think that I think you can take a young kid and put them in front of one of the most complex video games with no rules written down anywhere and they will learn how to play it in, in a matter of hours right <laughs> so I I think that you could stick them in front of some physics and, and they could figure it out so I do think I do agree that going for younger, especially middle middle school or decisions are made early on, especially for young women, young girls uh, make decisions about their careers early on as well. Uh, and so I think it would help for them to be more involved in, in, in doing science. So I think that would be good, but I don't know. I don't know formally uh, if CERN has a has a program like that. Concerning um, master classes. There were surveys that are taken, and they do take surveys. It's pretty much impossible uh, to to know from all of the the students, many, many students, tens of thousands of students uh, taking the master classes, where how this affects them, if they and and in what way is important? Because to me, I don't want them all to go into particle physics. We don't have room for them in particle physics. Um, I want them all to love science. I want them all to understand how to find truth, how to find data, how to find signal out of background. Um, most of them are, they're, uh, hopefully all of them are gonna grow up and vote. And so I want them to vote for people who support science and I want them to vote in an intelligent manner. Uh, I think that's, that's to me, my, my goals have changed over time. I think when I went into outreach, it was, I was gonna teach everybody, you know, Heisenberg's formula. And I was gonna teach, you know, everything. Now I'm just like, if there's like science, yes, I'm good. <laughs> um, so I don't, I know that, that some, if we ask uh, Ken and Uta, they probably have some statistics that was done early on. Uh, I do see, I mean, this, this is just, you know, not numbers. I don't have data, but I do see students and who, who have come up to me to say, yeah, you know, I did the international master classes and they're working at CERN. They're, they're young faculty working at CERN. I do see this all the time. Maybe that would have happened anyway. I don't know. Um, but I, 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 I doubt we have anything really extensive. I know there has been, uh, there is a, a young woman who's worked on her PhD, actually, she was doing communication, who tried to study and, and get this data from CMS, but it wasn't specifically master classes. It was just in general, what is the effect of science, uh, education, communication? But it's, it's, it's a hard thing to do, right? I mean, it's, it's almost like the question of, how effective has our research been in improving our world? That's, I don't know. <laughs> I mean, I was asked this question uh, by a brilliant journalist, Leslie Stahl, who's a 60 Minutes fame, said, okay, you got us the Higgs boson three years ago. What have we got for it? And I can't answer. You know, I could say is, you know, you, you have to come back and ask my great grandchildren uh, I don't know what a Higgs mobile is going to look like, uh, but, you know, because it's, it is impossible, it is pretty hard to do, but I know evaluation is important if you want to go and ask for money and if you want to go to funding providers and say, hey, here's the data that shows that what we're doing is effective. I'm sure that's been done in different countries and um, probably Ken and Uta would be the best contacts for that. So you could send a note to iPod people now and say, do you have a publication somewhere? There probably is something. How to engage more scientists on outreach programs? Yeah, how to engage with? I'm doing. That's what I'm here for. Right. Yeah. <laughs> um, there are some best practices, or I mean, some. I I think that, that can. So so it wasn't that long ago. I've been through many of these. I don't know why I picked these windmills to fight, but um, you know, our field is very conservative. As much as we all feel we're not, it's a very we're very. We need to be for science. But, you know, golly, I, I remember doing computing was negative. 
that was something you did after you built the detector. Okay, then you can write some code. You hack that together. And now we've gotten to the point where there's a huge conference that's at 600 people or so uh, every year called CHEP. It's computing and high energy physics, and, and it's dedicated to trying to come, you know, come up with better ways to do computing. Nowadays, um, and also in the other major conferences, there's usually some session on computing advances. Um, when we did the iCHEP in, in 2012 in Melbourne for the discovery of the Higgs, I asked uh, simply, can we, can we have a session uh, on outreach and education? And of course, Jeff Taylor, who's, who's my boss, he, he's, he's, well, he just, oh yeah, sure, of course. And so we did that, but it hadn't been before. That was never done before. And uh, we got that. And, and, and that was nice. And I noticed bit by bit, all the conferences start to have education outreach. Um, but what was useful, as your question, was not those parallel sessions, because often that's just the choir talking to themselves, uh, but plenaries, is getting a plenary, because then you have this auditorium full of 600 people. So much of this talk actually also came from a plenary time. Then you, then you can talk to, to people about what is out there and why they should be doing what they're doing. Um, so, so I, I mean, I don't know any other better way to do that. Sure. Other questions? Hi, uh, my name is Daniel. Uh, I'm, an, I'm an undergrad student. Uh, in the beginning of your talk, you explained that the the current uh, the current day adults are responsible for paying our experiments, our research. And during your presentation, uh, actually at the very be at very end, uh, you showed that the iPod uh, makes a lot of effort on long-term education to build the new generations of scientists, of adults, uh, even though they don't choose the sci scientific careers. But my question is, how can we how can we save the current days adults that are, are receiving this kind of conspiracies of this uh, garbage material that and bring the, bring them to support a little bit more our our science and uh, start looking to this kind of information about uh, uh, conspiracies about the climate change, about the, the CERN, our, uh, our, our bad villain mm -hmm. in, our, in our planet. How can we save these adults and bring them uh, to give more support to science? Mm -hmm. It's a good question. Um, we have to be more active. We have to do a lot more. Uh, I can't, we, just, we can't just sit back. And, and, and cry whenever we read these headlines, which I do every day. Um, but, you know, there are things you can do that are very simple that you might not even consider. When, when I go home now, I, I come from a very conservative small town in, in, in Michigan in the U.S. And, um, you know, these, these gave us people like Proud Boys and things like this. Um, I go back home and I, and I always tell the, the guy who runs the local TV channel it's an internet-based tv channel uh i'm in town i'm happy to come and give a talk and, and he and so he he always has me come I, I get i make some nice images and things like this he has the, the usual he's got a desk his little couch next to it you know, and um i mean he also has the boy scout troop come and sit there and and you know he has whoever local politicians come and sit there i just make sure i do that every time i go home i just do that because it's a way to reach out to an audience that's not thinking about this at all. And you can throw in all sorts of messages there. Um, <clears throat> I remember coming just after a, politi a local politician who I knew is from the right. They're all from the right there. And um, he, uh, he had signed something. The guy had noticed that he had signed something which actually supported uh, public education. But it, he was he reluctantly signed it. It was something that got some some more funding for whatever. And I just came on right away and I said, I just want to congratulate the representative on his strong support of public education. Uh, and it's really greatly appreciated by the people in our city. We all support it. You can do these things, right? 
don't 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 be afraid of it. Go out there and do that. Um, uh, do they? Your local media and all are always looking for content. <clears throat> so if you tell them, hey, I'm, I'm a physicist, I'm doing research. Um, I could tell you some things that are kind of fun. Can I come into the studio? They're probably going to say yes. Other thing you can do is I don't I don't know the politics in Brazil very well, but you're a democracy, so you have people who represent you. You have a deputy or a representative or something like that. You can talk to them. Um, they're in your hometown or somewhere nearby, and uh, sometimes they make visits, or they're in or they're in the capital. Just depends which level, but you they usually have forms I and mean, you know the ones mine has a form i hate him right he's terrible his politics are completely opposite mine but i will fill out the form and say you need to support research and we advocate all the time every year we go and we talk to all of the representatives all the senators in the u.s get somebody from the lhc or one of the other um or slack or these others we'll give a call and we'll talk to them or we'll go to washington and talk to them you have to do that. They have to know that we're there and we have a plan and this is really important and this is going to help the constituents. They might not realize how much money is coming to their area because a company uh, in, in their of their constituents got money to build something for the LHC. You got to dig that information out. They might not know that a school in their area had a virtual visit or had a master class done and that those kids you know, really profited from it. So you got to look up, look that up and, and let them know. So these are only some, some ideas, but you, you can do it. It doesn't take that. It's fun, actually. Yeah. Hi, uh, my name is Julian. I'm doing my master's degree uh, here on particle physics education. And I would like to know if there is any um, possible collaboration um, between USP and CERN in terms of uh, master's and doctorate degrees and um, educating teachers for educating students? Uh, that's a good question. So, so, so master's in, in physics education. You said, wow, that, that's great. Congratulations. That's a really good thing to do. <clears throat> I don't know uh, of formal relations, but it's probably just my ignorance. They probably do exist. Um, you can look and contact, I mean, CERN is just one entity out of many, but you can contact to see what kind of relationships they have. Um, usually, you know, for IPOG, we just listen, if there's somebody who's who's doing some cool, if you're doing a really cool thesis, and find out about it, then we'll say, you know, connect with us and tell us about it. We have, uh, as I showed you, all those people talking in IPOG, uh, we have anybody who, who has an idea and something that they want to put forward uh, gets 10 minutes <laughs> uh, to tell us about it. And then, and then we can look into making a more formal relationship. Usually what we do is informal, um, but an entity like CERN might have a more formal relationship, but I don't know. Hey, me again. You again. <laughs> uh... How can we respect the personal beliefs of people um, while we are communicating science in, in, in a way that we don't turn science into a religion? Yes, you're right. That's, that's <clears throat> I think it's an art more than a science that you have to figure out with time. I, I run into all sorts of different different things like this, which are interesting. Um, I was in, uh, I think it was Romania, and it was a music school. And there were fairly young students there. I think they were elementary students. And uh, after I'd given my whole talk, and I like to show like dark energy and dark matter and all of this stuff. <clears throat> and hold on a second, just try to clear my voice. Too much flying is not good for me. Um, <clears throat> it's not good for the environment either. Um, and she asked about dark energy and what is its relationship with chi, you know? Uh, and, um, and I had to be very quick on my feet there because this is a teacher in front of her classroom. 
You cannot embarrass a teacher. That's the mean. Don't do that. You always say it's a good question. There's a lot of tricks. It took me a long time. I'm a trained physicist, but I had great communication people who worked with me when I was doing edu I was you know coordinator for education and outreach. Uh, Claudia Marceloni was, was was our communication officer for a while. I think I still have whip marks on my back from her teaching me. Uh, you know, there, there's different, there are different tricks to learn. We also have some training at CERN with uh, people from BBC or whatever. It's, it's not so easy. This, you have to be sensitive. People have different beliefs. And for, for the most part, it's okay when someone's beliefs are filling a gap. I mean, religions and all these different ideas are just because you have some gap in your knowledge and you want to fill it with something. People aren't happy with there being nothing there. As a scientist, I'm happy with it. I think that's great, because that's an area we'll have to study. I just leave that. I, I just don't know. I'm happy to say I don't know. But there are a lot of people who don't want to say I don't know. They, 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 and they'll throw in whatever. Um, and you have to respect that. What you can't respect is, is an opinion. OK, so on data, on reality, OK? And I'm pretty harsh on that. Uh, I was uh, talking on a, 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 in Australia, there was a network of uh, reaching out to rural areas, very cool thing in, in New South Wales. And uh, some student in the, in the classroom there asked, he said, what's my opinion of global warming? And there I had to be not too sensitive. You know, I said, I said my opinion is completely unimportant. It's complete, anybody's opinion on global warming is unimportant. We're scientists. We take the temperature and we report to you the temperature. We see this. We can then compare it to models and show you its likely cause. And we can show you likely what it's going to do to our planet. That's what we're trained to do as scientists. Our opinion about that might be quite strong, but it's irrelevant for them. They can make their own opinion. But they cannot say the earth is not warming. I won't accept that. We, we, we become completely dysfunctional. That's, I mean, the people I put up there on the slide, they had faces, were people who are dysfunctional because they just neglect data. And we cannot accept that. If it's data, it's data. I had a wonderful, um, there, there's a, um, an artist in uh, Taos, New Mexico, who I love to partner with. She is just outstandingly organized and she puts together things there. New Mexico has this great mix of people, a lot of indigenous peoples, people from uh, all over, uh, you know, who, who came across from Mexico or from other, other places Latin America. And, um, uh, and she brought to it, she, she had me come. I, I had done virtual visits with her and she said, I want you to come. We're going to do a really cool thing. And I came and she introduced me to Steve Tamayo. Steve Tamayo. Uh, is uh, Lakota. He was a water protector who she met, she met up protecting um, the water in the Dakotas where there was where they were trying to build a pipeline, and he taught the cosmology from the point of view of the Lakota, and there were great great stories, and I listened to him. We both looked at each other like, what are we going to do? We have a bunch of kids here. How are we going to do? We had no idea what we were going to do. It ended up being fantastic because <clears throat> the things that we agreed on 100% is what we measure, what we see. Uh, and, uh, and then how you interpret the stories, their stories are rich and there were ways to pass things on. They weren't writing journals. They weren't, they weren't making publications and, and, and putting them up on spires or whatever. Uh, they were telling stories, but they were stories that gave you you know, the reason why there were these seven stars in a row with the seven sisters, when, you know, it was okay that you, you can find ways uh, to find common ground. One, one of the coolest, I'm, I'm sorry if I'm spending a lot of time, but a cool, really cool story um, came from uh, the Inui uh, on, up, up in the Arctic. There was this old uh, Inui there one of the, one of the, who they respect. They actually respect old people. Um, something we could try doing. I'm, I'm starting to think that's an important thing bit by bit. I don't know why, but, um, but uh, and uh, he said, there's something's wrong. 
the earth is, is on a strange tilt because when I was a child, first sun, first sun means when the sun finally comes up in the spring. First sun came through that window there. It was there, it would come just over there. But now first sun is coming through that window. This is, it's, the, the earth has, has, has tilted. This is conclusion from this. And others also noticed some effect like this. And they went to NASA finally. They finally, NASA was like, eh. And they, they finally went to them and said, can you check this? <clears throat> they did all sorts of measurements and said, we're sorry, but no, the earth is not tilted. But then there was someone who knew of a story of, an, of a Russian ship that had gotten stuck in the Arctic. And I wish I remembered the, the name of the captain, but the captain, they, they, they tried to survive there. It was very cold. It was the winter and they, they got frozen in. And um, many of them did survive, but he had told them, and he was brilliant uh, with the stars. He was, he was a navigator. And he said, I can tell you exactly on what day we're going to see first sun. And he had given them a date. And first sun came up about a week earlier, 10 days earlier. And they said, how can that possibly be that he was wrong by that? And then so he, this guy looked at that and he looked at this other information. He realized there was a correlation with the temperatures. So if you know the effect of the um, flying Dutchman, a ship that you see above the surface because the light is, is curving so that it looks, it, it lights curving because it's warmer up above and that the sea is colder. And, and so you see it, it looks like it's up there, but it's, it's really, the same thing was happening in these cases. The sun was rising effectively, but if it was really, had been the same temperature, it, they wouldn't have seen the sun. The, the light was coming over and that's what they were seeing in the Inuit. So the Inuit were actually measuring global warming, but they didn't realize it. They were seeing that the temperatures were, were changing. So, so you have to find some sort of common, common ground and, and be open-minded uh, about, about what they're saying. There's probably some science behind it. Okay. Hello, Steve. Uh, I would like to thank you for your speech. My name is Renan, and also Julian, and I am also a PhD researcher here in science education. And we're doing a cooperative research on the undergraduate level of future teachers with particle physics. And, and we've been doing international master classes here in, in NewSpe for almost 10 years, mm -hmm. something like we started this in 2012. Uh, and now, and I'm also a physics teacher. I teach in, in high school uh, and I bring almost 10 students for the last 10 years. Mm -hmm. And these 10 students for the almost 10 years, we have four students who are here, students is studying physics. And the master classes was the major thing that make them to do physics here. No? And my great. question is that the international master classes is, is a very interesting program, but it's because the particle physics have this special environment where scientists and teachers and people can talk with each other. We also have an interna international outreach group organizing this. And do we have things like this in other areas of physics, for example, cosmology and I don't know, solid state or, or because particle physics uh, uh, appears to be something special with it. Uh, this environment occurs in particle physics and I, I'm doing it because uh, of this environment and I, I want to know if there is any other things with it. Yeah, I had that exact same question when I, when I started out <clears throat> six years ago. I thought, okay, I think we should reach out and find out the international biology outreach group and the international chemistry outreach group and, and those doing different types of physics. And I looked and, and, and I did not find much. There are some doing outreach in, in different things. There's a, there's a group uh, that's specializing in gravitation because of gravitational waves. Um, 
and uh, they're they're just starting up. I grab, I think, to call it or something like that. But but um, we work closely with them. In fact, the guy starting that up is a member of IPOG as well. Um, so there are topics that work. I uh, I don't know what prevents others other than that we have this unique environment that we're this we're international to build particle physics experiments. We have to be international. We're not going to get that funding from just one country alone. And that makes our environment completely different so that we can do these programs together and we can try to provide an umbrella. Um, and it's, it's, it's a topic that's conducive to doing. I, I would think, I would think any, any science topic, you could make some sort of masterclass on it. Um, and I, I don't know why, or maybe I'm just ignorant and I don't, and, and there are other things out there. I mean, there are some great, People on the web, there's YouTube's got plenty of stuff, and there's there are really um, good communicators who are out there doing little experiments and demonstrating physics and and, and things like that. Um, but I don't know if they're actually bringing those experiments to classrooms around the globe. That would be nice to see. Um, I I don't know why we you know if we're the first and 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 why, or if there are other things going on out there. I I, I but in my six years, I never found anything that was equivalent. Uh, to what we have does anybody know <laughs> other physics physics outreach i mean obviously other topics can be done um but it, i mean i and one of the big advantages of particle physics is that we're on the cutting edge right we have these new accelerators and and, and there's science and, and the important thing that comes into the picture is the excitement you know, the, the students get to meet someone who's doing research right now and as opposed to just taking a ball and rolling it down uh, an inclined plane. I mean, that's important, <laughs> but you know, Sisyphus was doing that a long time ago. Um, it's, it's uh, it, it, I mean, I, I'm sure like NASA has programs or, or ESA has programs too, because yeah, it's exciting to meet an astronaut is a great thing. You, you need something. I, I think that, that, you know, just sitting in a classroom learning F equals MA you know, gets old after a while. But having a, someone who's doing research or talking, even if it's over Zoom, talk to you makes a big difference. I don't know if that would work in chemistry. Maybe it could. I don't see why it wouldn't. Um, or, or other fields, solid state, you know, someone who's making discoveries, there's, there's a lot of really great physics that's going on out there. So, you know, maybe you need to lead the way for that. <laughs> I don't know. And then we'll go online. We'll be with you soon online. Okay. Hello. Again, thank you for the, the talk. My question is, before me, Caetano had uh, asked if you, how to engage scientists in, in outreach. I have a similar but different question because normally we try to do outreach activities based on my, our own experience. My my question is, uh, do you uh, at uh, IPOG do you have any experience in training scientists to do outreach? Yeah, that's that's a, <clears throat> I mean yes, but usually it's it's um, trial by fire. Um, I mean we bring new researchers in to do master classes all the time, and right? so they usually start out as as just sort of uh, mentors. Or someone who's there to facilitate, and then they eventually start start doing it. We're training people all the time to do uh, visits, virtual visits, and things like this. This is a very very common thing to do. Um, sometimes teaching your colleagues to do something is hard because obviously they're an expert. Why would they listen to you? <laughs> we all have that disease, right? Um, but. Uh, was there, was there another part? Um, maybe I'm missing part of the, the question. It was just if you, do you have a regular program by training the scientists to do outreach. Yeah, having a regular program is a good idea. And that was brought up to me earlier as well. Um, whether or not we, we should in, in the experiments or in IPOG or, or somewhere. CERN does offer a communication, usually it's a communication course uh, where they teach you how to communicate because they they teach guides at CERN to be able to go to the different experiments. Most of that is is about you know how to make the thing work, what buttons to push and, and stuff like that. 
but they do have a course early on where they, they teach you how to communicate things. Um, other than that, um, maybe we should get more organized for it. I, I think that's that would be a good idea because it's, it's not evident. Uh, I remember my first communication course with some a couple of women who used to work on the BBC. And, and this was before we, we came online, the LHC. And they basically took me in a room and beat me up. And they, they, they they were just like, <clears throat> you know, okay, the LHCs come on, Alice sees collisions, LHC, BCs collisions, CMS sees collisions. How come there's no collisions at Atlas? What's going on? Is it filmed? Is is Atlas a failure? And 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 uh, harsh questions like that. Of course, we never. I think because CERN has been so open and such a nice policy towards welcoming the media that they've been very kind to us. Even when we blew up, what ten days after we turned on. The LAC had a pretty big problem. They were very kind and considerate uh, to us. And I think that was because we were completely open and, and honest with them. But um, the communication lessons were good, but there's much more to education than, than that. Um, so I, I do think it is, is a message I'll pass on that we try to consider if we could have courses, and try to get someone professional to like, like like as soon as he's finished his master's uh, to come train us how to do science education. So great. I think you'll have some questions on the YouTube. Questions online. <clears throat> oh, here. Okay, so Mariana says, Boa tarde. Boa tarde. Uh, sometimes I feel that scientists have a tough time communicating science because they feel that in order to get people to understand what they're talking about, they have to lose rigor in the content. What would you say about the need for language adaptation or giving up a little bit of rigor? I, I totally agree. <laughs> we, we especially, especially scientists who teach, they want to give the whole story, and you can't. Uh, but you have to learn to read your audience and to see that the audience is is paying attention and they're getting something out of it or not. So it can depend. Some some really want the details, um, but in, in many cases, you need to give a, a simple, accurate, but not precise. That was, a, that was the lesson that I learned. Be accurate. Don't, don't say something wrong, um, but you don't have to give the whole precision unless they ask for more details about how something works. Um, I don't, I, I, I agree scientists, but that's, we learn that by, again, by trial and error. I, I mean, I completely failed my first public talks or my first public, you know, talking to a, a, a middle school, uh, kid. And I think it was one of the first, I think my nephew asked me to come to his class and then, and then I, you know, I was terrible. I remember being terrible, uh, but bit by bit you learn. Um, we did, a we did a virtual visit. I usually like to talk in one of my talks, I talk about this. Dave Barney is a good friend of mine. He was the CMS um, outreach coordinator when I was the Atlas outreach coordinator. So we hung out a lot together. We did a lot of things together. He's my neighbor as well. And um, we were doing uh, uh, a virtual visit. I invited him to come over. We did a virtual visit together to Seward, Alaska. And there were these middle school students. And one of those students uh, was very energetic and he said, I don't get it. How do you measure what you can't see? And I mean, at the time we were sort of talking about dark matter and things like this. And I gave some sort of mediocre response about that. Then I spent, I've spent decades since then thinking about that question. That question is fantastic. That's what science is. That's exploration. You, you either, you go someplace, you build some ship and fly somewhere or go somewhere or, or, or you build these devices, better, stronger devices to be able to measure what you can't see because that's all it's about. We're just rest uh, seeing is a whole other question, right? Whether you're looking in the electromagnetic spectrum that's just for our eyes, which is very limited or everywhere else, or if we're using dark matter, I mean, we're mapping out dark matter from lensing. Uh, so, I mean, the questions that, that that you get asked are, are are can be deeply profound, and you do have to th think through. And you're going to get it wrong the first few times, probably. 
but you do learn by by talking and talking and and I, I really recommend that. I, I asked once um my my childhood hero uh was was the character this guy played. His name is Alan Alda. He was an actor who played Hawkeye Pierce in Nash, which nobody here, they're, they're all too young to know this, but this is a, a very popular television show, extremely popular television show uh, in, in the US. And it was about army doctors and the Korean War and all. And um, he came and he has made it, he likes science communication. He has an institute in Stony Brook a for specifically for science communication. And I asked him in 2012, I said, can you come and and talk to us about doing science communication. And he said, no, you don't need me to tell you how to do science communication. You just do it and you do it and you'll get it wrong. And then you'll do it again and you'll get it better each time. And I'm not sure he was completely right with that <laughs> for, for everybody, but I, I, but I think it, it, it is important to, thank you very to much. try. So let us thank our speaker again. Yeah. yeah. Thank you.